Hello, today we're going to be talking about a really current issue, and that is immigration to the UK and the effect of this on the macro economy. So discuss the macroeconomic effects of increased immigration to the UK. Now, you've got to be careful when you get a question like this, because this doesn't say migration. If it says migration, you might be able to talk about emigration and immigration. But this question is particularly focused on the inflow of labour into the UK or otherwise and its effect on the economy. We're going to look at a few things first about context. The, this is a particularly useful area to think about because recently after Brexit uh, in 2016, so somewhere like that on that diagram, we've seen a significant increase in the number of total arrivals to the UK. You can see that curve there going up. And net migration is also up as well. We've got over we've got 672,000 uh, being added to the total population, going up to 700,000 last year, I believe. And therefore, this is a in, in really interesting um, area to consider about what the effect of it would be. Um, we can, in the, this context, the wider context of the question, um, and something that you should mention in macro essays, if you can, is certainly the UK's productivity problem. Um, the fact that productivity growth is low, and it can be summed up in three words, investment, investment, and investment, according to an, uh, an author of a recent report. This is an interesting diagram here, which shows the issue that the UK faces, and that is, there are two clear things I want to highlight here. One is that this block here is the contribution to a lack of capital within the UK uh, and its contribution to the problems of UK productivity. And the other area here that skill again, uh, issues of skill of the labour force holding back um, our outputs per worker. Um, and if you want to illustrate that further, I'm sure you probably have seen that diagram before. It's very commonly used and we can see that the UK productivity growth has been very, very weak since the financial crisis of 2008. And we can link that to low public sector spending and low investment. Over here, um, we've got some other areas to think about. Um, this is from The Guardian a month ago, and talking about the fact that one in five NHS staff are now non-UK nationals uh, coming from all over the world. And that's called brain drain when you, when you pull um, skilled workers out of other countries. Clearly that is a useful thing for the um, UK, the NHS and the health system. And then finally, there is this idea of a skilled worker route into the UK. And uh, you just need to know that um, there is a salary threshold. You need to be able to earn a certain amount of money. And you also may be able to apply with uh, if you have PhDs or you have a job offer in a specific shortage occupation. And so that will give you a skilled worker uh, visa as one route into the UK, which we could think about, which might change the type of immigration that we're seeing into the UK. Right, let's have a look then at how we can structure this. So that's the, they are the um, that's the data. Definition key point: I would certainly define economic growth and productivity, and we're going to use growth and inequality as our two points. Now, what I'd like you to do is. Pause the video, try and on rough paper, try and plan out how you would go about doing that. Remember that long-term memory, if you're writing it out, if you're trying to summarize, it actually aids memory rather than just copying out what I'm saying. So do try and plan and then compare what I've said to what you said. Right, coming back then. So our first point, we want to use this diagram here uh, to talk about how immigration affects economic growth. We want a positive argument and we want to say that um, starting off, we start off at AD equals LRAS, um, 745,000 uh, migrants to the UK in 2023. Um, we can say that those migrants will earn, earn money, they will have jobs and therefore consumption will rise. Um, and you may want to give an example of that. Really good application, for example, you might talk about workers in hand car washes spending money in the local supermarket going down to Sainsbury's. That's consumption, it's domestic expenditure on domestic goods and services. That will shift AD to the right, but at the same time, because that's not a very expansive argument, we might want to shift LRES as well. We might want to say that um, the quantity and quality of labour and labour is a factor of production, and therefore it will increase the productive potential of the economy. That will shift LRAS to the right, something which I don't think I've mentioned there actually. So I can say LRAS to the right, from LRAS 1 to LRAS 2, and therefore the 
uh, full employment output level of the economy will rise from YF1 to YF2. And that includes both the increase in AD in the short run, but also the increase in LRAS in the long run, creating long run and short run economic growth. So powerful argument and one of the most common arguments for uh, supporting the idea of immigration. Right, this is a difficult essay to plan because it's easy in your evaluation here to possibly take away from your evaluation of the next point. So you need to plan this quite carefully. Um, and what I want to do here is to try to use the context of the UK economy. Always try to get back to the context. And our current context, we've got Brexit, we've got pandemic, post-pandemic issues, and we also have the productivity issues that we've had since 2008. So we're going to look at that and say, well, how can you plan a point that says that might link low wage labour, if we assume that it is low wage labour, um, to productivity? How might that impact output per worker? Our argument above here was overall economic output, the value of all goods and services produced in the UK economy would grow. grow. But what about the output per worker? Is that going to grow? So that's, that's an important point. So pause the video, think about how you might go about um, talking about that, using some of the things that we've seen on the right-hand side, that data. Right, coming back, well, um, to summarise some of the things that we said when we saw in that data, the UK has had uh, low productivity growth since 2008. That's per worker, so that's not overall GDP. Um, and the, the mechanism by which this may be May, may occur is because if you have low wage labor, then we must remember that capital and labor are substitutes to each other. You can either invest in capital or you can use labor. You can have go for capital intensive production or you can go for labor intensive production. So, for example, hand car washes are a great example of that. You can either get an automatic car wash, invest in capital, or you can employ low wage labor and have them doing it by hand. Now, the low wage labor option um, will result in low productivity growth because each worker is unable to produce a significant amount of uh, additional um, value to the economy. Now, we know that the UK has low public and private investment. That was borne out in the statistics that we saw over here. We saw that that was the problem over there. And therefore, capital intensive production uh, using highly trained labor uh, might be a more sustainable route. You might argue, well, it might be better than simply relying on um, our cheap uh, imported or you know, imported labour or cheap labour from abroad. Um, and that's, that's certainly an argument which the Conservative Party have been making. It's very current as an argument and it does hold some truth. However, <clears throat> we are, and you could argue against this now and say, well, actually, in the context of the uh, pandemic, we have a lot of uh, people who became sick, who became ill. Our participation rate, um, the number of, uh, of those who are um, in the labour force as a percentage of the working population, is going down. Uh, and one of the reasons for that is people have taken early retirement, are not willing to work. And so it might be argued that actually low skilled immigration is useful to replace those people who are now not willing or able to work and have fallen out of the labour force. And they are performing essential jobs that provide services, goods and services for the rest of the population, which is really important. So you've got an argument both ways there, uh, which you can go for. Right. Our second point, um, using the Lorentz curve and the Gini coefficient, um, how do how does how is that going to be affected by immigration? And the argument is that it may well result in higher inequality. Think about how you could make this argument. There are multiple ways in which you could create this argument. Okay, coming back, we've got two ways in which here, well, I've said we can increase inequality. Firstly, if we assume, again, this may not be true, but if we assume that the immigration, Im immigration is made up of mainly low-skilled labour that has a low marginal revenue product, possibly lower skilled, um, it, they m might have, for example, low English language skills, which means that it's difficult to be able to um, work with in, in local companies, for example, and it would re reduce your productivity. Um, therefore, low income workers would therefore increase the number of those workers who are at the, the bottom income quintiles and those in relative poverty. 
But a, another really interesting argument is that you might argue that the local population in poorer areas, so for example Boston in Lincolnshire, has a very, very high concentration of workers from Eastern Europe working in the agricultural sector. And there is greater competition for social resources. So if a lot of the immigration goes to poorer areas, that then stretches health and education and social resources in that area. And when they become stretched, it's the poor local population who are disproportionately impacted as they are more reliant on those services. And so you could argue that immigration lowers the, uh, the, the has a significant impact on the poor uh, in those areas, shifting the Lorentz curve out from LC1 to LC2. The Gini coefficient rises from A over A plus B plus C to A plus B over A plus B plus C. And then you may argue that that causes some social issues as well, social dislocation and so on. Now, this is all we have all the way, all the way through this essay. We have really just sort of assumed that we are talking about low skilled immigration, but we may not be. So what can you think about? How could you think that this might depend on the, the type of migrant with reference to some of the things that you saw at the beginning of this video? Pause it and then come back. OK, well, we know that the UK has attracted a lot of high skilled immigration and do nurses and doctors are just an absolutely prime example of this. Um, we have shortages in the NHS now for nurses and doctors and cutting immigration would have a significant impact on that. Um, these people have a high wage, they have a contribution to the health system and therefore immigration would also lower prices of goods and services, increase the quality of goods and services. It might lower inflation. And again, that has a disproportionate impact on the poor. If I go and wash my car, I get a better service, I get a lower price, and therefore I am benefited um, in general. And particularly that could impact the poor if, it, if we're talking about inflation. Now, this is also dependent on the visa system. Um, and the, we know that the points-based system is also targeting those who are working in higher paid jobs above £26,000, but also in those in shortage industries, STEM subjects, and those with PhDs. Um, so I think it's really important to think about that. A lot of the debate that we see on immigration is based on low skill, but I don't think that's necessarily always true. And um, cutting immigration in general is likely to have significant effects on companies across the economy and therefore have a significant effect on the economy in general. Right, judgment. How can you uh, summarise your arguments and come to an overall judgment? Think about how you do that and then we'll come back. Right, well, ultimately, we can see that it is dependent on the type of immigration and wider visa policies. It's clear that economic research has suggested that uh, immigration is, is generally very good for the economy. It creates a lot of growth. Um, but this has to be weighed against the, uh, if you have excessive low-skilled immigration, it does tend to have social effects and long-term impacts on the labour intensity of production. Um, however, we can't just say that the UK productivity problems are because of uh, Im immigrant labour. That is based on a lot of other factors, and I don't think it's quite fair to put, put the blame on immigrant labour. Uh, clearly, government policy is probably more, uh, is more due to, to, to deficiencies in that area. And therefore, we could say that, well, if we are going to have... Um, lots of immigration, which is useful to the economy, then government policies are required to mitigate its negative effects. And clearly, the occupational mobility of the local population, the education uh, and the transferable skills of local people is very important. So they can move out of those jobs at the bottom, for example. And also the provision of adequate social resources funded uh, from the higher tax revenue that you're going to gain from higher immigration and directed at those areas which require it most is very important. Ultimately, I would, um, I would argue that immigration is very important to the economy, but it needs to be managed in the correct way. I hope that's useful and I hope that's a very current issue that gives you a bit more insight into this issue if it were to come up. One last thing I should say is that this could be a paper three essay as well, the micro and macroeconomic effects of immigration too. Thank you for listening. Hope that was useful.